Well, bless the Lord. Let's continue with our session today. Still speaking, the end of the age, the last days. And we teaching some truth. Of course, we can't teach the whole truth about the Holy Spirit, but we have to teach some truth. And truth that can help us in these last days. If ever there was a time in history in the body of Christ that children of God should be acquainted with the Holy Spirit, it's now. This is the time. You, you must be living with Him. You've got to be in fellowship, in close fellowship. I'm not just talking about a, a long distance kind of relationship. I'm talking about a close, close, close fellowship with Him. That is what, re, what is required today. I'll tell you what, as we go through these studies, as much as we can do this in this session, you would realize how important the Holy Spirit is in you coming in alignment with God's word and God's purpose and destiny for your life. And then you realize His work in your life is the work that can actually build you up and take you further. Now what is also um, a big concern is when people try to build their lives all on their own. You know, all on their own, they try to work hard and do all of these things. In fact, they, they work so hard and they don't achieve everything. Some people do. Now, I'll tell you what, here in this world, if you are not a double standard kind of a person, if you are not corrupted in this world, you won't make it even in business. You've got to be corrupted. Just like the world system. You've got to do what the world is doing. You've got to compromise your faith, your standard. You, un you understand? In order for you to actually make it in, in your work, in your business, in your home, with your finances. But you don't have to be corrupted. There is someone that is with you that will give you supernatural power and show you how to achieve what other people cannot achieve with all their hard work, with all of their degrees and all of their studies and all of what they claim to have. But you can do it only through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the power of the living word inside of you. Are you listening? God didn't leave you an orphan. He didn't leave you on your own to, for you to fend for yourself and struggle on your own. No, that is sheer ignorance. He didn't. Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. He said, but when I go, I'm going to send to you the promise of the Father. Why? Because he's going to do all of these things for you. How many of you actually call on the Holy Spirit to help you? How many of you actually consult with him when you're about to make a decision? When you're about to say something to him, uh, rather do something for yourself or do something for the Lord or do something for your family. If, you, if you're actually planning, uh, I'm just saying, if you're planning on a business now, how many of you will consult with him? Do you know he's the biggest and the greatest businessman ever? Do you know the Holy Spirit know more about business than anyone on this earth? Then why wouldn't Christians consult with him? Jesus said that he is, an, he is a helper. I'm going to send to you a helper. He is an advocate. And he's the one who will empower you. And then he's the one who gives wisdom, knowledge and understanding. For everything. I remember the time that uh, in the young days I used to do a lot of mechanical repairs. And I used to get successes where others have failed. I used to diagnose certain things on a vehicle that others would, would struggle. What, what was my secret? How did you do this? Well, I had a very strong relationship with the Holy Spirit. Even at that time. I will ask Him. You know, I will ask Him. And if there's something so difficult to do, even if there was a nut or bolt that was so hard, difficult to open, I will ask him, I said, Lord, help me with this. I need to hope with this. So I have had successes in my life in different places because I understood him to be a 
a helper. He's ready to help. He is ready to help. But the reason why he's not helping many Christians is because they don't want his help. They're all sufficient all on their own. They just, you know, God, as I said. Many of them think they are God all on their own. Some of them even talk like that as well, act like that, walk like that, and live like that. But I know, <laughs> I weep before him sometimes in the office. I said, Lord, if it wasn't for you, and if it's not for you now, what would I do? There's nothing I've ever actually accomplished in my life without you helping me in it. There's nothing. Whatever I have done, wherever I have been successful, you know, it was you. So I've been negotiating to buy a house, another house, you know, because of the sale of this one I'm living in now. And I found one and I prayed. And I, 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 I never had the full, full budget for what the owner was asking. I, I, I said to the, to the agent, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make you an offer, but it's not going to be the figure that you're looking at. He asked me, so what's the figure, Pastor? So well, I offered him 70,000 rands lesser than what he had the place advertised for. And he smiled. So wow, that's a big drop, Pastor. You think the owners are going to... I said, I don't know. I said, I don't know whether they will agree. But I told him. I told him, well, I just, I'll just tell the Lord, I want that house. And this is, this is the budget I have. And that's all I have. I cannot increase that right now. And that's it. So after I signed that document and he went away and he said, okay, pastor, I know you're going to pray now. And he went away. So I raised my hand to the Lord and said, Lord, I want that house. It seems to be a good house. I mean, fitting for me. I want that house. I don't know who the owners are. So I'm asking you, you know, to help me get that house. And then he called me again and a few days later and told me what, and he's laughing on the phone on the other, the other end. I said, what happened? He says, well, Hassan, they've agreed, they've given, they've taken the offer. 70,000 rands, cheaper than what they advertised it for. So this is what I'm trying to tell you. If you can't take an example like that and ask the Holy Spirit for help, when you are in a situation, then what other lessons would you learn? What do you need? What do you, everything you need, everything you need to know. Wisdom is a giver of wisdom. He's the giver of knowledge. He's the giver of understanding. Why wouldn't you depend on him? I'll tell you what. Those legalistic preachers have preached so much against us. I remember the time when I was growing up in the church as well. I mean, they made it seem like it was impossible for me to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit because I wasn't good enough. I mean, that's the kind of messages. Up to today, some of them preach like that. Until one day, I was in a service, and this one visiting speaker came. Ah, this man was anointed. I tell you what, he was anointed. And I was sitting in that meeting. I think it was a three-day meeting or something. And he was visiting the church that I was in at that time. And, and, and I was amazed. By the way the Lord used this man. I was amazed. I just sat there mesmerized with the way the Lord was using him in the word of knowledge, with the anointing, with the healing. He was also a singer, so he was actually singing anointed songs. And I said, man, Lord, look at this. I said, um, he, he just has a relationship with you, Lord. You know? And then, that triggered something in me. And a desire inside of me to have that kind of relationship. You know, with, with the Holy Spirit. But I was told up until that time, I wasn't good enough. I don't qualify. The Holy Spirit only goes to certain special people. What a lie from the pit of hell. Really, that's a lie. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm going to send you the promise of the Father. Because you'll need him. In this world, there's tribulation. In this world, there's a system. And all of that is going to work against you. That's why you need the Holy Spirit. Because the system of this world will work against you. It will work. It's not working for you. It will work against you. 
all the systems of this world. Only the Holy Spirit will make you to go above those things. So you will have supernatural intervention in your life in everything that you want to do. And he's right there. I'm telling you what, he is so awesome. He's so beautiful. He's so awesome. He's so perfect in what he does. You know, I keep thanking him. I say, Lord, I thank you for being tolerant with me. Because, you know, I can be really radical sometimes in his presence. I can say him things and do things. And I say, Lord, thank you for being patient with me. You know, and I tell him, I tell him, if I don't get it the first time you, uh, you told me something, I didn't get it the first time, please don't stop. Keep telling it to me until I get it. Please don't leave me alone. And, and he, he does that. You see, he knows me. He works with my personality. He'll work with your personality. You don't have to be like me. You don't have to be me. You just be you. But you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Now, as I said to you in the last session, that some people claim to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. And you and I know they don't. Because the Holy Spirit would lead you into truth. He will lead you to do things that are right. One of the things the Holy Spirit will not do is keep you away from a church service. Are you listening? Yes. That's one of the things you wouldn't do. If a person claims, no, I have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, but, you know, they, they don't have a, a prayer life, uh, an effective prayer life. They don't like church services or don't attend to church services. I mean, these are, like I said in the last um, session, these are baby steps things. The Holy Spirit will get you to fix that up first. Because now it can't take you further. If you just can't be in a church service, you're making every excuse why you're not there. And then if you're giving priority to other things in your life, then him, then you don't have a relationship with him. Because the first thing you would do is that you will consult with him and give him first priority. Then everything that is in your life that pertains to your life will take second place and you will have victory in places that you, you were struggling in. Why? Because he knows your heart condition. Some people's heart condition is not right. That is the reason, the main reason why he cannot have fellowship with some people. The main reason why he cannot lead some people is because their heart condition is not right. Okay? Humility is the key. Humility is the key. But we'll, we'll, we will deal with that as we go in. So just go with me now. We're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4 to 6. All right? And this beautiful portion of scripture. And we have such trust through Christ towards God. Verse 5. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves. To think of anything as being from ourselves. But our sufficiency is from God. Can you see that? Verse 6. Also, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So we're going to read the same thing from NLT now to get a little clear understanding, a little more clear understanding. All right. So you can see the word confident there. That confidence was not supposed to be in yourself. So when you talk to people and, and they keep using the word I, I this, I that, I like this, I like that, I do things like this, I do things like that, you know how I, I then you must firstly understand that that is a God. You're just talking to a God, a demigod, not real God, you know, <laughs> you understand? Because I, 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 what does the book of James teach us? You must say, if the Lord's will is, I will do this. If the Lord's will is, I will do that. I, 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 and then in the end, no, God did this for me. No, God didn't. You did that all on your own, with your own brain power. Why? You see, church, listen carefully. 
Let's read that verse of scripture. We are confident of all this because of our great trust in God through Christ. Confidence, sufficiency. All right, we can never ever be sufficient. In fact, we're not even good enough for ourselves. How can we be good enough for anyone else? We're not good enough for ourselves. But I'll tell you who made us good enough. Let's go to verse 5. It is not that we think <clears throat> we are qualified to do anything on our own. See, our qualification comes from God. Say amen. amen. Can you see that? We're not sufficient on our own. God is, our, is the all-sufficient one. You understand? Our confidence is, we have our confidence in God, not in ourselves. Because we cannot qualify ourselves. It is, not that, uh, it is not that we think we are qualified to do anything on our own. This is, this is the point I'm trying to bring into your life, into your mindset. You need the person of the Holy Spirit. You need this relationship with him. You need to learn how to depend on him. Because you don't have what it, what it takes to conquer this world on your own. You need the Holy Spirit's help if you need to conquer this world. If you need to conquer that enemy. Are you listening? If you need to live above your enemy in this life, in this world, you need the Holy Spirit. You can never ever do that on your own. It is not that we think we are qualified to do anything on our own. Our qualification comes from God. He's the one who qualifies us. Verse 6. He has enabled us to be ministers of his new covenant. This is a covenant not written, not of written laws, but of the spirit. The old written covenant ends in death. Okay, the old covenant, it ends in death. But under the new covenant, the spirit gives life. So it's so very different. We're not a part of the covenant of death. We are the part of the we are part of the covenant of life. Are you listening? So the letter kills. The laws of Moses kills. But the spirit gives life. Are you listening? So if you want to achieve anything in this life, try to get in this relationship with the Holy Spirit. Do whatever you need to do. It's going to be hard work. I can guarantee you that. It's going to be hard work. There's a lot of things you have to do. In order for you to have this confidence in God through Him, you're going to have to do a lot, a lot of work to get to that place. Position is very, very important with Him. It's very, very, very important. You can't be positioned anywhere and expect Him. You see, one thing about the Holy Spirit, He has His own terms. He has His own way of doing things. He wants you to align yourself with His ways. He cannot align Himself with your ways. That is why you'll hear a lot of people say this. I heard someone say this sometime. You know, uh, prayer works. Hey, prayer really works. Really? Okay. Then if pr your prayer works, then what was God doing? Because you are highlighting your prayer, but who have you been praying to? Was it your prayer or was it God? So even in our prayer life, we tend to become and seeming to become like we are self-sufficient. I prayed and this happened. I prayed for that. I prayed so many hours. I... You, you understand? So even our prayer life becomes our sufficiency. It doesn't even show that I prayed and this is what my father did. This is what my God did for me. This is what the Holy Spirit did for me. This is how he helped me. You won't hear them saying that. Oh, prayer works. Prayer works. I spend time in prayer. But you know, there are many, 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 many people out there don't get their prayers answered. And they wouldn't tell you that. They wouldn't tell you because now their prayers have just become a, like a religious ritual. They aren't praying to get it answered. They're just praying because they, have, they are Christians. I don't pray just because I'm a Christian. I pray to get an answer. I'm a very, very miserable person if I'm not under the anointing. I'm very, very miserable. I feel very miserable. 
I can get very ag agitated. I can, I, I can, <laughs> I am not myself. I must understand how many years under this anointing that I have been under and been with him. And, uh, you know, as I said, there's a lot of hard work. And one of the things that you have to do if you feel that your life is not right, to maintain a relationship with the Holy Spirit, hmm? declare a fast. Because that is the purpose of, a, of fasting. No, the Bible doesn't teach that you must fast and pray for material things. Fasting and prayer is to help you cleanse yourself so that you can maintain a relationship with the Holy Spirit. That's the purpose of fasting. I didn't know this in my early age as a young man. I didn't know what I was doing. But when I, when I saw this man in that meeting that day, it really made me hungry. I said, Lord, I was praying. I said, I want to, I, I want to have this, this man a tremendous relationship with you. He's been talking to you right in front of us. And we saw that he was doing things. How can he maintain that? So I started to pray. That all week I was praying. The whole week I was just praying and praying and praying. I'm asking the Lord and then finally, I, I sensed an urge inside of me to do something more than pray. Okay? Two things I had to do more. One of the things I had to do more is that uh, fast. So I had to declare a fast. So I, I declared this fast. I used to fast for an entire week, every third week of the month, for a whole week. All right, that's the first thing I had to do. The second thing I had to do is study the Bible like crazy. All right, I had jobs just like everybody. I work shifts like people, you know. I work long hours, I work night shifts and all of that. But I used to st still spend four hours a day studying the Bible. Four hours. So don't give me your excuse. You understand? Now you see what happens here is that I became so hungry for him that I used to, during my week of fasting and prayer, I used to cry. Every time, even at work, I had a chance to go and pray. I used to get a lot of chance to pray at work. I had some favor on me. So I used to go and pray and cry to him. He had to work. Okay, nobody would be around, but I used to cry to him. Desperate. I, could, I should keep saying to him, Lord, I just want you. All I want is you. I want to have this relationship with you, Lord. Teach me, Lord. Show me, Lord. And then that will go on for, for hours. You know, if I'm not satisfied with that, I will go and uh, apply for a whole week of paid leave. And then spend that entire week at home fasting and prayer, in fasting and prayer, to get more serious. So I was crazy, right? Mm, people still think I'm crazy after today. But that's me. So I developed this here. He comes first. Right now as I stand here before you, my interaction and fellowship with the Holy Spirit comes first. Because He teaches me how to love Jesus. Believe me. He teaches me how to love my Father in heaven. Without Him, I would not be able to do that. So as I mention that now, there is work. You have to do work. You can't be sitting on your lazy boy chair, you know, or wherever you sit, and go and daydream, or do whatever you do in your spare time. Or sit and watch movies. Oh, you know movies are fake. It's a story someone cooked up and they wrote the story and they made it into a film. When you start realizing that you're watching something fake, then you won't want to watch it. But there are some, some films based on, on true life story. Like I not too long ago, I watched a Turkish film on the persecution of Christians in Turkey. And I was so moved by what I saw, and I, it troubled me, you know. And they moved away from Turkey, they went to, to another country, just because the, in Turkey they were, they were persecuting the Christians, they were stoning them, they were killing them. So, as I'm saying, that was based on the true story of what's happening in that, in that nation. But apart from that entertainment, 
I'm not a person for entertainment now. I don't like any entertainment. I'm not looking for any entertainment. So I can't sit and watch a movie with other people. I'm crazy. Yes, I know you, that's what you're thinking right now. But I'm telling you, that is lifestyle. That's my lifestyle. Are you listening? So if you can spend three hours watching a Bollywood movie and you can't play for three minutes, you poor thing, you. And you want the work of the Holy Spirit in your life? It's going to take some kind of a sacrifice you're going to have to make. You know, when people walk into your house and ask, where he or where she? Well, in the room, they pray. Crazy. This part of the day, they pray. They didn't think that of you because they thought that of me as well. They thought that of Jesus. They thought that of the disciples. You know, as I mentioned to you, there's one church in India, the Saturday service, 7 o'clock in the night. The service finishes at 7 o'clock in the morning. I mean, we start 7, we finish 8, people still can't make it for that. But they started their service 7 o'clock in the evening, on a Monday night, finish off Tuesday morning at 7 o'clock. How many of you like to be part of that church? Hmm? You talk about being hungry, being desperate, being thirsty. Who do you think if God has to visit somebody right now and use them as vessels, he'll go to that church? Because many of them are ready there. Why? They put themselves in a state of readiness. Are you listening? You can't be lost in the world with worldly ways, worldly understanding, get caught up in the system of this world, talk stories with people, get involved you know, with your workmates, get into a discussion that is ungodly. You can't be all lost. No wonder when people come to a service, they can't even be part of the worship because their mind is so much out there. So the worship is foreign. This is like a foreign atmosphere now. How do I do this? Everybody else is doing this. I can't do this. Yes, you can't do it. I understand because you've been doing, doing other things during the week. So even a worship session is not appealing to you. That's what happens to Christians. That is why revival, restoration revival is coming. So we're just going to read from Luke um, chapter 11 verse 5. You just want to read this. I want to just instill this in you and then we'll probably do more work on it in the next session. So read with me. You're reading from the NLT. Alright. Luke chapter 11. You're reading from verse 5. Then, teaching them more about prayer, Jesus, he used this story. Suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight, wanting to borrow three loaves of bread, you say to him, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit, and I have nothing for him to eat. And suppose he calls out from his bedroom, don't bother me, the door is locked for the night, and my family and I are all in bed. I can't help you. Verse 8. But I tell you this. Though he won't do it for friendship's sake. If you keep knocking long enough. He will get up and give you whatever you need. Because of your shameless persistence. You got that part of the story? It's important for you to know that. That is a parable. Okay, a parable is an earthly story with an heavenly meaning. I want you to see this very, very, very closely. So let's go to uh, verse 9. And so I tell you, keep on asking. This is not what the original Greek actually says. It doesn't just say ask. In this case, it says, keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. Verse 10. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. 
Let me ask you a question. Whose word will you go by in this life? By the word of your friend, your boss, your spouse, your children, your neighbor? Who will you go by the word of the Lord Jesus Christ? Listen to what he said. He says, for everyone who asks receives. Do you believe that? And everyone who seeks finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Do you believe that? Why doesn't that happen in some people's lives? It's because they don't believe that. Again, it comes back to them being self-sufficient all on their own. That self-sufficiency, that self-confidence in ourselves, in our own ability, it has to leave because it's a stumbling block. It's, our, it's a stumbling block to our faith. So let's continue. Verse 11. You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Yo, oh, what a question. Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So, if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? How you like that twist? That's a twist. He didn't say how much more your heavenly father will give you what you're asking for. No, no, no. He will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. It's not plain and simple, is it? Because <laughs> do the people really want the Holy Spirit? No. They want their prayers answered. I ask God for this. And I'm believing for it. And I'm praying. I'm even fasting. For this. But what did the Lord say? If you know how to give good gifts to your children. Hmm, how much more your father? Read the context. And try to get an understanding quickly. What is the context? The context is personal needs. Are you listening? The context here yeah, is personal needs, things that you need. But when you ask, seek and knock, everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks find, and everyone who knocks, the door is open unto them. And you have a need. Your child has a need. He asks you for bread. Will you give him a stone? He asks you for an egg. Will you give him a scorpion? If you're being sinful and evil, if you know how to give your child bread when he asks for bread and give him an egg when he asks for an egg, do you think your father don't know how to give you what you need? Oh, yes. He knows. So what is the father giving you? He's giving you the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the answer to all your needs. Oh. Oh. If not, you'll be praying dead prayers, dry prayers. There will be no anointing in your prayers. Your prayers won't even touch a ceiling in your house. Why? Is because it's all based on self-sufficiency. And I tell you what, when you listen too much to prosperity preachers, I'm not knocking them, but just recently the Holy Spirit started cautioning me about a few things. They don't teach you how to be dependent on God, how to be dependent on the Holy Spirit. They teach you how to be dependent on yourself. 
So your whole life here on the earth is based solely on sowing and reaping. That is not what the scripture is teaching. Sowing and reaping is part of our lives. And we have to. And we have to sow. You understand? But you mean to say, I can, I can, I can uh, live a life of sowing and reaping without looking at God being sufficient enough for me? So who is this person that's going to help me to look at God as being my all-sufficient one? The Holy Spirit. So this is what the Holy Spirit does. Yes, you will anoint your giving. You will anoint your sowing. He will anoint your seeds. He will anoint you. He will anoint the ground that you're sowing it on. But he will still teach you. Your dependence is not on this. Your dependence is on God. God is your all-sufficient one. You understand? Your qualification for prosperity, for wealth, for breakthroughs comes from God. It comes from the presence of God. The Holy Spirit is here to bring the presence of God right into your life. I love this one song I've been listening to. It's an Indian song. It's a Tamil song. And there's one sentence that says that your presence makes everything possible. My strength is not good enough. That song says, my strength is not good enough. My efforts are not good enough. It is your presence that makes all things possible. People pray. They pray dry, dry, dead prayers. Week after week, month after month, they've been praying. But when the Spirit of God is in operation in your life, when you are sensitive to His move in your life, let me tell you, first thing that will happen, He will change the way you pray. He will change you. You'll be creative in your prayer. In other words, you'll be praying in ways you never prayed like that before. You'll be using words that you did not use before. Who's teaching you these words? The Holy Spirit. Okay, so, when you have needs, this is what Jesus is saying. He says, listen to this. When, this, when you go to your, to your friend and say, friend, I got another friend visited me. I got nothing to feed him. Can you give me three loaves of bread? All right, you might say, hey, three loaves? Okay, those loaves in those days were little, like your palm size. They were not the loaves we have today. All right, so he said, well, and then he said, well, I can't. I'm in bed now, and my family is in bed, and the doors are locked. Jesus said, well, he'll give you the bread. If you prepared to be shameless, and you're prepared to be persistent. You see, I'll tell you one of the things I found out in, in my life as a child of God, and even as a minister. The people with more needs pray the least or hardly pray. But when you sit and talk to them, they'll only talk about their needs. But they never pray about it. If they pray, they pray so little. And that's it. But they're looking out who's going to come and help them. Who's going to, you know, help them in this situation. But when you, when you study their life, they do not have a prayer life. Or if they do pray, it's very little. It's like not even heartfelt. You see, this is what he is trying to address here. You can't go and stand there on the door. Some people have a lot of pride. That's why others don't want to help them. You understand? It's time for you to take your pride and throw it away. If you want to get your prayers answered. So in other words, if you want the three loaves of bread from your friend, you've got to stand at his door and you've got to keep knocking. He'll come and give you the bread, not just because you've been asking and because you are his friend. He'll give you the bread because you, you are being persistent. Just to get rid of you. So God is not like that. He's not that, like that friend. Okay? The reason why we need to be persistent, we need to make ourselves become the prayer that we are praying. Oftentimes people pray what they are not. 
That's why it's not answered. You must become your prayer. Your walk has to be your prayer. Your talk has to be your prayer. Your worship has to be your prayer, what you've been praying for. In other words, you have to become your prayer. That's what persistence in prayer does. You're not begging God. But you see, you are not in alignment as yet. You understand? You are very far away from getting that need met. But unless you stand at the door and keep knocking, be persistent and say, God, I want this to happen. God, this is my desire. But you see, and when you depend on the Holy Spirit, say, Lord, I need you to help me. Holy Spirit, sweet Holy Spirit, I need you to help me. I don't know how to pray. I've got this thing in my mind, Lord. I don't know how to pray about it. Do you do that? I do that. I sit there and say, Lord, I, I just I need to talk to you about something. But I don't know how to do it. How to actually get started. And then sometimes what I do, I break out in tongues. I pray in tongues. All right? And then as I continue, I start, then I start praying about that, that thing in English. Because I don't know, maybe I was praying in that Pray for that need in tongues first. And this prayer in English is now probably an interpretation of what I prayed in tongues. There are many ways the Holy Spirit can help you. But people are not patient enough. They're not obedient enough. They don't love Him enough. When you love Him, you would love His presence and, you sit, and you'll stay there. Alright? The other thing the Holy Spirit will do, and I will close with this, the other thing that He will do, He will correct you in your prayer life. When you're praying amiss, because many people pray amiss. What did James say? He says, many people pray and do not receive what they're praying for because they are praying amiss. Understand? Then he says, some people don't get what they're praying for because they're praying uh, for something that they're going to take and use for, their, for other reasons. Are you listening? How many of you know the Holy Spirit will not answer your prayer to add to your pride? He will not. I've been preaching that from the 80s. He will not answer your prayer to add to your pride. He has a way of taking you on a journey. Of cleansing your words. Cleansing your thoughts. Cleansing the way you talk to God. Cleansing the way you present to God your need. The Holy Spirit has a way of teaching you. Educating you. And bringing you and positioning you through persistency. He has a way of doing that. You can't pray, you know, rubber dub a dub thank you for the grub. That kind of prayer, you know. People are like, you know, they'll give so much of valuable time for unnecessary things. But not for the necessary things where you really spend time with God. Talk to Him. And stay there until the Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you what, what will happen. He will teach you the Bible. So let me say one more thing to you. Never go and spend hours in prayer or time with God in prayer without your Bible. Make sure you read your Bible before you pray or after you pray or in between your prayers because if the Holy Spirit has to teach you something, He's going to use the Bible. He can't use you and your crooked mindset. He's going to have to use His Word. So never go to pray without your Bible with you. Understand? Have your Bible. Be ready to open the Bible and read maybe right in the middle of your prayer. Maybe before you start, maybe at the end. Because the Holy Spirit's involvement in your prayer is important because He'll use the Word to cleanse you. He'll use the Word to put faith in you because faith comes by hearing. So when you read the Word, you're getting faith. It comes by hearing the Word. So when you're reading it, you're reading it to yourself. You're hearing it probably what you're praying, what you're reading, sorry. And then you're going to develop and it's going to stir up your faith. It's your involvement in your prayer life and only the Holy Spirit can have help you be involved in your prayer life so you can become what you are praying for. You understand? So the next time you go to pray, you don't know how to pray, say, Lord, sweet Holy Spirit, help me. I don't know where to get started in this. That's the, all the reason more why you should des desire the, the gift of tongues. Because the gift of tongues is such a powerful gift that you can use and break out of the natural atmosphere, the threshold of the natural, and get into the spirit with the gift of tongues. 
And then you can go into the flow. Thank you, Lord Jesus.